With your hands, you can reach, grab, and throw. With your legs, you can run, squat, and jump. And with your belly, you can do belly dance. Just like this, different brain regions have localized functions that share duties. Let's start with prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex, or PFC, is the part of the brain that is the reason for you being such a nerd. If you give an exam and score poorly, you might think you're in trouble. Meanwhile, your PFC is bawling its eyes out for being judged and creating more neural connections for your next judgment day. It's located just behind your forehead, so headbutting people is quite an intellectual endeavor. It's involved in various high-level cognitive functions such as helping you decide which brand of toothpaste to pick, your social behavior, personality whether good or obnoxious, and moderating complex thoughts and emotions. It's also one of the last brain regions to mature, so if you feel like you're still immature, there's hope. Unless you're over the age of 25. After that, you're just stuck with yourself. To really understand the functions of PFC, it has been divided into various sub-regions, mainly these three, although there are a few more. Dorsolateral PFC is situated in the middle and upper regions of the PFC, extending towards the sides or lateral parts of the brain. It's responsible for working memory, which means holding information temporarily. If you meet a cute girl and successfully secured her number because of infinite risk, but that unfortunate day did not bring your phone with you, so you speed walk all the way back while reciting the number in your head until you can safely write it somewhere, then this guy has to thank for. It's also essential for shifting between different strategies, adapting to new information, abstract reasoning, and everything that starts with the word quantum. Orbital frontal cortex is located just above the orbits of the eyes and forms the lower surface of PFC. It helps to inhibit impulsive or socially inappropriate behaviors, otherwise the monkeyness would be intolerable. Whatever decision you make is evaluated by this part and it rewards you for making good ones with tiny dopamine hits. It also gives emotional points for those actions and adjust decisions accordingly, which you learned the hard way after you thought the worst you can say is no. It's basically a reward punishment evaluator. Medial prefrontal cortex is located at the center of the PFC between the two hemispheres of the brain and is involved in introspection of your own thoughts and self-awareness, which means thinking about what you're thinking and why you're thinking that. Basically ancient Greece entertainment method. It helps you get in the shoes of other people and understand their perspective, emotions, and intentions, which helps you realize, why do I still hang out with this person? The PFC is not fully developed during adolescence, ages 10 to 19, which is why you don't have complete access to this glorious thing called logic. It leads to impulsive behavior, risk-taking, and volatile emotions ready to be shattered at any mild mishappening. This is due to an underdeveloped ability to regulate emotions and foresee long-term consequences. You know what we should do today? We should draw faces on our bellies and march around the neighborhood. Bro, that's such a brilliant idea. You're a genius. That's what my grandmother says too. Maybe I am a genius. There's a reason why you look for advice from an adult. It's because their PFC has matured and they're better able to make complex decisions, regulate their emotions while you throw tantrums, and control their impulses. The PFC is heavily involved in mental health. People with ADHD often have dysfunction in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, leading to issues with attention and impulsivity. Poor emotional regulation and excessive rumination can lead to depression. If the orbitofrontal cortex is unable to regulate fear responses, it leads to anxiety disorders. However, the PFC can be strengthened by physical exercise, cognitive training, and closing your eyes for 8 fucking hours every single night. Hippocampus. You might have heard of the famous saying, I think, therefore I am, famously said by René DiCaprio. But I beg to differ. A better version would be, I have hippocampus, therefore I am. Because it is the part that encodes and consolidates memory. Whether it's episodic memory, which is memory for experiences such as recalling what you did yesterday, or semantic memory for general knowledge and facts such as the earth is flat. I never said the facts have to be correct. Without hippocampus, you're living a new life every day because you keep forgetting things that are happening around you. When the information is first received, like if you read or experience something, it is stored temporarily in the hippocampus. It integrates the information and transfers it to the neocortex where memories are stored for the long term during sleep. But that can't happen if the hippocampus keeps forgetting what information it received. Damage to the hippocampus can lead to enterograde amnesia, where a person loses the ability to form new memories, but their old ones remain intact, so they'll still remember their annoying cousins. It's also responsible for spatial memory, allowing you to navigate and remember environments. You don't want to forget where the bathroom is in time of need. It contains specialized neurons called place cells that fire whenever you are in a specific location and these cells help you map your surroundings. If you close your eyes and try to navigate your house, you'll realize you have it all memorized. Your little toe might suffer some damage in the process, but it's used to it anyway. By experimenting on numerous rodents, it's established that the hippocampus enables the ability to learn mazes and navigate environments. Meanwhile, Daedalus says, hold my nectar.
Various disorders can affect the hippocampus. It's one of the first regions affected by Alzheimer's, which is why memory loss is one of the earliest symptoms. Over time, the disease causes the hippocampus to shrink, smaller than your heart, which is already quite small, leading to more significant impairments in the memory. In PTSD, chronic stress and elevated cortisol levels due to Vietnam can damage the hippocampus, which is linked to memory problems and difficulties processing traumatic events. A smaller hippocampus is often found in people with chronic or severe depression. So how can you Arnold your hippocampus by keeping the brain active through learning new skills, reading, and solving puzzles. This can stimulate the hippocampal activity and promote neuroplasticity. Amygdala. Amygdala is the emotional roller coaster. If you scream in the face of fear after seeing a spider move into your apartment, hop joyfully after having your favorite dish, or cry immensely because you didn't want to say goodbye to the caterpillar you found in your garden, every emotion is invoked by this region. It resembles an almond. In fact, the word amygdala is Greek for almond. One of the amygdala's primary functions is detecting threats and triggering body's fear response. It does not matter if the threat is real or not. The amygdala vigilantly watches for any kind of threat, whether or not the winter is coming, and when it does, it turns on the alarm system. Think of a chihuahua that is either shaking, barking, or shaking while barking. It's possible for your amygdala to be a golden retriever that a lot of times does not understand real fear. In that case, you will be cool as a clam and be willing to engage in any risky endeavors. Remember hippocampus that does all the memory work so you don't forget who bullied you in the fourth grade? Amygdala works closely with the hippocampus and helps in consolidating the memories, particularly those linked with fear, trauma, and pleasure. The stronger the emotion of an experience, the vivid the memory. This is why you remember emotionally intense experiences better than mundane ones, which is basically 80% of my life. If one day you were walking back home, and out of nowhere a person running behind you pulled down your pants and continued running, and you stood there while everybody around you was laughing at your beautiful flower imprinted undies, you are more likely to remember that. This can be considered as what are known as flashbulb memories. These are memories that seem to capture a moment like photograph that are associated with emotionally intense experiences such as natural disasters, traumatic events, or major historical events like 9-11. Amygdala is also crucial for social and emotional behavior. Seeing someone in pain makes you feel empathetic towards them, or witnessing an annoying whiny brat in public makes you want to adjust his face a little bit to the inside. That's your decision and amygdala guides you in decision making in these emotionally charged situations. It works in tandem with the prefrontal cortex that is responsible for decisions and it tells the amygdala, even if that kid is annoying, you might not like spending the night in jail. So make a pass on this one, we'll find you a more annoying kid that is worth the prison time. There are several emotional disorders that are caused by irregularities in the amygdala. If your amygdala is hyperactive, it will start perceiving threats in situations that are objectively safe, creating panic disorder and social anxiety disorder. Uh oh! What? People! <gasps> oh no! People! People suffering from PTSD have heightened emotional reactions to trivial things like a balloon popping can be viewed as a nuclear war, so you wear your radioactive suit while your wife is washing the dishes and your dog is licking its butt. People with autism show abnormalities in amygdala function, which is why they have difficulties processing emotions and understanding social cues. Reduced amygdala activity makes you fearless, and you will often engage in dangerous activities such as riding your bull to the western theme fair to fight a mechanical bull. So even if the amygdala is the size of an almond, it is is deeply involved in shaping how we feel, react, and even remember our experiences. Motor cortex. No, it doesn't give you wheels. Although if it's not functioning properly, you might need some. It's the region that is responsible for voluntary movements. It's subdivided in three main regions. Primary motor cortex, or M1. It sends signals to the muscles that you would like to flex your biceps in the gym. Different parts of the cortex correspond to different parts of the body. Like large areas control hands and facial muscles. Premotor cortex. It's involved in planning and coordinating the movements based on on external cues. It helps prepare and organize motor cortex for upcoming movements. Here's what premotor cortex looks like in action when you're playing catch. The ball is coming to you and the premotor cortex goes, okay I see the ball, I must raise my hand. Raising my hand now. It should be aligned with the ball. Hopefully it is. Otherwise the eyes are going to be mad at me again. Okay, next step. Holy crap, what is the next step? Right, close the fingers when the ball touches the hand. Okay, that's all. Planning completed. 
and nailed it. Supplementary motor area. It also plans and coordinate movements, but not the same ones that are dependent on external cues. It controls internally guided movements like when playing a musical instrument. Learning a new motor skill such as playing a musical instrument or typing can lead to changes in the motor cortex. Over time, the area of the motor cortex controlling the hand might grow and become more refined as the skill is learned. After injury, such as a stroke, the brain can sometimes reorganize motor cortex to other regions of the cortex, allowing the patients to recover some movement. This process is often enhanced through rehabilitation and therapy. Broca's area. Broca's area is a region in the brain associated with language production, particularly in speech and writing. It's your brain's chat GPT, but a bad one. It is located in the frontal lobe, typically in the left hemisphere. It's divided in two main regions, Broadman area 44 associated with phonological processing, that is organizing sounds like what did the fox say, and Broadman area 45 associated with higher level language tasks like grammar and syntax. Good luck with that if you're learning German. The primary function of Broca's area is the planning and articulation of speech. Think precisely before you speak, man. It is involved in controlling the movements necessary for speaking, such as the coordination of muscles in the lips, tongue, larynx, and vocal cords. It also plays a part in understanding language, particularly grammar and syntax. It's crucial for synaptic processing, helping people construct grammatically correct sentences. But Broca's area can become insecure when you need to apply for a job or write formal emails. Then you will use every grammar checking tool. It is also active during the production of sign language in deaf individuals and is involved in writing. Damage to Broca's area can lead to specific type of language disorder known as Broca's aphasia, making it challenging for people to speak. Visual cortex. Visual cortex is the part of the brain responsible for processing visual information. It is located in the occipital lobe at the back of the brain and interprets everything we see. It consists of several areas that form hierarchical system of visual processing. These areas include primary visual cortex, which is the first area that receives input. It processes the most basic information there is, like detecting lines and borders of the objects, interpreting fine details and textures, differentiating between light and dark areas, and detecting motion. Secondary visual cortex, or V2, processes more complex patterns and begins to interpret basic shapes and forms. It integrates the information from V1 and prepares it for higher level processing. It helps the brain differentiate objects from their backgrounds. And tertiary visual cortex that consists of V3, V4, and V5. V3 processes the shape and form of the objects. It is crucial for understanding the structure of the objects in the visual field. V4 is responsible for color perception. And damage to this area can lead to acromatopsia where a person loses the ability to perceive color even though their eyes or V1 are functioning normally. V5 is involved in motion detection. It helps the brain perceive motion and track moving objects. Damage to V5 can lead to motion blindness where individuals are unable to perceive movement properly. The visual cortex is capable of neuroplasticity, meaning it can adapt to changes in sensory input. For example, if someone loses their vision early in life, the visual cortex may become repurposed for other sensory functions, such as touch or hearing. This reorganization enhances the remaining senses, allowing individuals to develop heightened abilities in non-visual tasks. <music>